and the and the the anti uh, Goldilocks is the the that non feel good factor you get when things get stubbornly consistently more expensive even when everybody's spending less buying less uh really borrowing less retiring debt and prices continue to go up and continue to kill you because you had decades worth of ever dropping rates from the Falker era to the eventual turn in the bond market which we called in August of 2020 we said the March 2020 blow off uh in debt valuations was the end of the debt bubble these things will turn and that's the end it is the end for the debt based system the next thing you're not going to have 40 years you took 40 years to put this uh, hyper leverage situation it will end in four or less um, in other words, it's the escalator up and it's the slam down, elevated uh, down uh, on this. You're not going to get a 40 year slow unwind. It's going to get deeply, deeply disorderly. And that's kind of where we are. On this episode of the What the Finance podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming back Francis Hunt, who's a trader, technical analysis and teacher and originator of the Hunt Volatility Funnel Method. So Francis, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Delighted to be back with you, Anthony. Thank you for asking me. No problem. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation because uh, a lot has changed. I think we talked sort of six months ago, uh, sort of at the, the peak of the um, banking crisis in the US. There's lots of concern. And then since then, the economy, well, I guess at least markets, has, I guess, continued to slowly ch chug along. Uh, but, but I know during that conversation, you were talking about how you think you know, the last 40 years, we've sort of experienced maybe this Goldilocks environment of massive growth, massive asset appreciation, but you think maybe that's shifting and we could be at that anti-Goldilocks situation. Uh, so I'm not sure if, yeah, if you can maybe go further into that and, and why you think that is the case and if you still think it is the case. Yes, it was very much associated. So the Goldilocks period of the economy was a phrase that Alan Greenspan brought around or that was brought around around him. I don't know if he's the originator. I wouldn't go so far as to say he was the originator of the phrase. But the investment banking community, while calling him the great genius, uh, in essence, what he did is he just happened to be the guy that was around timing-wise when a number of core trends happened. And uh, he came in very uh we came in to a kind of 1987 uh crash uh, just before the 1987 uh, stock market crash and he responded to that uh, with liquidity so he got the benefits of the tidy up team the cleanup squad that was the Falker era that essentially uh so Falker was stepping down and Falker was known for the guy who actually did what was necessary when there was a very stagflationary environment coming out of the tail end of the 60s into the 70s. That, of course, involved the Nixon period of 71, where they took gold off the window. There was the Vietnam War, where there was blanking, blanket bombing in the name of fighting communists in a different part of the globe, uh, where essentially, you know, they did carpet bombing of entire forests. They did Agent Orange, which is chemical weapons, basically, um, which destroyed plants, uh, when you saw people give birth to, you know, uh, abnormal children, you know, all the things we criticize uh, Syria and Iran for doing basically, but were doing before. Um, that was the whole era. Uh, and as a result, it was stagflationary and people didn't trust the dollar very much. So there was quite a lot going on. France asked for their gold and they actually sent a ship to the New York, New York Harbor to collect it. And that's when the window got closed. Uh, over time, in the name of being temporary, of course, a temporary cessation of convertibility to the gold standard, which then eventually led to the floating rate exchange that we had today. So following from that, Falker had this loss of confidence in the dollar and all of these things, and he tightened rates, he kept tightening rates, and he kept tightening rates to conquer inflation that went double digits because they created too much money as a result of this war spend. Then, of course, the dollar was one of the most significant currencies, the, the most significant currency. So there was a lot of cleanup that was required there. And it ended up deep in the double digits rates and the ridiculous loss of value of debt and a very difficult environment for the economic growth. And then uh, shortly after that, when he was done in the early 80s, you ended up with a real clean slate uh, in essence. And you ended up with, uh, now that New York, uh, the States wasn't at war in Vietnam anymore, uh, that officially lost that war, uh, what ended up happening was uh, you got globalization started to unfurl. So uh, Kissinger and Nixon had also done work with China um, just prior and then around that era. Um, and what you ended up getting is that you started to get 
US and European companies outsourcing their manufacturing base to uh, the lowest common denominator outside of the, the world. And of course, as you had this very stark difference in wealth between Europeans, Westerners and Americans and um, yet to emerge emerging nations very early doors, you ended up getting the likes of Nike, getting their footballs uh, sewn up by kids uh, in, uh, you know, India, Indonesia, Philippines, China, etc. So we got this lowest common denominator that led to incredibly low cost. And of course, these workshops got organized and brought together. And of course, they didn't have labor standards that they were complying to. So but the West could pretend that wasn't the case because it wasn't happening in their country. Uh, and we started this globalization period. So this was an incredible pressure, downward pressure on the cost of manufacturing things. So previously you had, you know, Pittsburgh and you had all the steel workers and you had in Britain the coal miners and all of this and this. And now all of these industries disappeared for service sector type jobs that were higher paying and required different skill sets, et cetera, and more lawyers and investment bankers, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, all of that sort of thing and less miners needed. What you ended up getting is you got a big churn in how people were repurposed for labor in those first world markets. Uh, and then you saw a lot of that more manual labor type uh, manufacturing role, uh, very intensive going offshore. That led to this downward pressure that was very disinflationary. So uh, actually things cost a lot less. You could have more designer designs, yet you could have, um, you know, you could have them mass manufactured on a very low cost. And you could almost have people wearing very close to high fashion, high end expensive clothes. And they could throw things away and buy a new one and everything was a lot cheaper. I mean, in the, people don't realize that in the 50s and 60s, you literally had your coat. That was your coat. And you donned it, you fixed it, you repaired it, et cetera. And it was very similar. And people would know you by your coat that you wore because literally you'd have one, one or two things at tops of this. What now became the case is people had, you know, plenty more clothes than they needed uh, and would change, drop things, throw them away, hand them down, um, et cetera, et cetera. And that, those are just simple examples in the in sort of like clothing and various other things. I mentioned footballs. But what essentially that did is it made a, a lot of things a lot cheaper. And at the same time, the technological advances of farming saw scale farming being able to be done much, much more on much lower amount of people. So eventually you could run a, you know, 40,000 hectare farm in Canada going up to 100,000 on four or five people and combine harvesters and a lot of other things. So food based production was able to be really technologically advanced and scaled that the cost denominator went a lot down. But the farmers didn't get that profit. The supermarket chains emerged. So you had the, the coming out of Walmart and all of these places that got really aggressive and they sucked up a lot of that profit. Um, and so you had disinflation in uh, food and manufacture going on in an environment as labor, low cost jobs uh, moved offshore. So that gave this impression that there's absolutely no inflation, even though we've got low interest rates. In fact, we can lower them even more. So Greenspan was the big pants dropper in terms of rates. Every time there was a little puff or puff of a crisis, he'd bend over and drop his pants around in the knees. Uh, and as a result, this led to a perpetual liquidity money creation cycle, which was absolutely brilliant if you understood this because you could become part of the speculator class. You bought real estate, you bought equities, you bought everything and you leveraged long. In fact, part of Warren Buffett's success and one of the main parts of this, and we had an interesting um, interview we're going to be releasing um, as well um, that highlights this. In fact, we were talking to Jay Martin and duration is one of the key things to making money. You know, uh, the big thing is that Warren Buffett started in his 20s and is still investing today in his 90s. If you compound for 70 years, you don't even have to compound a very big number. The duration makes you king. And essentially, he showed up in and around the 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 60s and ran the entire 70s, 80s uh, and got into the real meat of the growth, 90s, uh, noughties, 10s, etc. on equity, continually being net long equities and adding and everything he bought, he bought also cash generative companies like insurance companies. Uh, everybody bought more cars, everybody bought more motorcycles. It was wealth effect. The boomer generation essentially caught hold of a very good demographic peaking uh, and he was truly, truly very, very scaled. Um, and he was there perpetually for an immense duration. And he was net long equities. And he can and he reinvested the dividends to buy more. And he continued to buy and buy and buy. Uh, in essence, he just was a major net long 
uh, equity bull market in an environment with disproportionately low interest rates. So asset values were able to hyper value uh, in an environment that there still was no inflation because there was no downside. There wasn't any meaningful inflation, you know, two, three percent. Remember, the mantra of central banks is always a little bit of inflation is important. So you must be keeping devaluing. Uh, this is their favorite echoed mantra. You don't want deflation. So that's why you want a little bit of inflation. This is their theory. It's not mine. I disagree with it entirely. Um, but it, what I always say is central banking cartels are based on the inflation policy. Inflation is a 100% policy because that gives them all the benefits. They get to issue more money, which they get to decide how it gets used. So they can give, do bungs, dirty deeds with the military industrial complex. You can have uh, family of politicians being intermediaries, brokers. You can have entire companies like Halliburton that are intermediaries and brokers that are taking Big Mac stores to Iraq where all your soldiers are, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's an absolute corruption fest for the insider cartel to benefit from. And you're, uh, you're creating this new money. It doesn't look like anybody's had anything taken from them, but in fact, you're diluting their dollar in their pockets. So you want to continue to do this. And this is what they've been doing. So inflation is policy, central bank policy, because it allows theft. It also allows you to be uh, dragged into higher marginal taxes over time, because we're at one point, you know, $1,000 a month was a good salary. Now, 10 grand in the US is probably not a, a particularly spectacular salary. Um, so, I mean, you keep getting dragged into higher tax rate. They don't have to put you, tax you further. You, you're dragging yourself in a compounding basis into ever higher extraction levels and you're wondering why the number keeps getting bigger that you're supposedly earning and everything but you don't feel any richer you know it's taking a long time to accumulate things and now your wife is working and she's also got salary increases and you know cost of living increases and various other things and she's also finding it harder to come out and now you you know where before you know there was one storeman uh, earner male and there was a stay-at-home mum and they lived great and had a car and a home that they paid off early now you have two highly qualified professionals, both in the workforce, struggling to make ends meet and pay off a mortgage. How did we get to that from the 60s to this in the 90s and the noughties and now up to the 10s and 20s? Well, it's because of uh, inflation and uh, wages actually lagging inflation on a compounded basis, on an ongoing basis. So the Goldilocks economy was this great big easy or productivity miracle. So they created a lot of balloon juice and arguments about how fantastic this is, um, essentially. But what you are getting is a one-source benefit on offshoring to the lowest cost common denominator and then running much lower interest rates that saw uh, the ability to lend be super, super easy and a gearing up and financialization of everything economy where people now spend 90 months paying off 40 percent of a car and having a 60 percent balloon payment and after that amount of years which is quite a substantial amount in the states uh the car is actually worse less it's worth less than the 60 percent balloon payment you still owe on it these are shotgun financials uh mechanisms for over leveraging an economy and when you have a super low interest rate relative to uh the the environment this is exactly what you get you get a borrow culture um, so we had a borrow culture. Now what's happened is that uh, six months of daytime, you eventually get six months of night. That's what happens if you go to the North Pole. You don't, you, you don't get more than a day's light uh, without getting a day's darkness. If you decide to pull forward a whole bunch of con consumption right from the future, because essentially borrowing is pulling forward consumption. You're buying a bigger house than you should before you should, et cetera, et cetera. And you're using other people's money. You're pulling forward future consumption. It's the must have it now. It's the absolute inverse of the marshmallow test for children. Postponed consumption gets you more marshmallows. So where you used to have a building society and you, and you saved in it and you kept saving in it until you got a substantial part of a home, uh, and then you literally had 50 or 60% and you, you paid, uh, you know, you allowed a small loan for the rest. Uh, those days were gone now. Now people were putting 5% down and they were getting a personal loan to do it. And they were getting 95% mortgages. And then you got the 100% plus mortgage where you actually bought the home and you got a personal loan thrown on top of it with an extra rate and all sorts of um, skullduggery. So in essence, it's been an an absolute liquidity experiment combined with the once-off benefit of um, offshoring work. 
uh, and globalization. So now we actually have the converse and the converse is occurring because we bifurcated the supply chain. We're picking fights with different nation states, the Russia, Ukraine, and many other things. So now we're saying, no, there's certain people we won't buy oil from. It's bad oil if it's Russian oil uh, because it's come out of the Russian soil, it's bad. Uh, but oil that's come out of uh, Saudi Arabia is great where they happen to stone women uh, for being teenage pregnant and various other things that are pretty vile. But nonetheless, we, we choose our morals and we decide which oil is good and which is bad and which we allow to buy and which we don't. So now we're now reducing the pool of workshop. We are bringing, we reshoring or friend shoring, which means bringing to Mexico, which is one of the reasons the peso has been one of a pretty down strong currency for quite a while compared to the dollar that many people haven't noticed or spoken about. But you actually start friendshoring, which are countries close to you, not quite like you, don't quite have the same labor laws. And some of it comes all the way back home onshoring entirely but now you find that people don't work for the prices that they used to work out there and so you get this inverse effect of the deglobalization um, or just part thereof because it's not a full deglobalization we mustn't over exaggerate but there is certainly a deglobalization element of it so what that means is you get a, a one-off major lockstep increase across the board on prices because now you've got to pay somebody who has to buy their food at Walmart in the States, has to be able to pay a rental check, even in a, a poor area, it's a lot more than living in a shanty town in the Faela in Brazil or wherever you were previously. And so now you have um, this one sort of up. So now you have a stubbornly high inflation. So you get the absolute corollary of where's inflation? We can just keep dropping rates and speculating. There's still no inflation. There's still no inflation. Productivity, a miracle. Now you get, even when you're cutting costs and living within your means, the inflation keeps keeps going up and why does it keep coming where's it all coming from so you get the inverse feel-good factor of the no inflation one sort of benefit and the liquidity experiment now you've got a deleveraging deglobalizing so now you've got all this hyper leverage and hyper overvalued assets and the biggest asset class that we simply must discuss is debt and this is why rates are higher for longer because they are issuing a never-ending uh, production line of debt and of course, Yellen being the fool she is, she did a lot of it when the rates were cheap on very short term instead of taking the opportunity to push it out on much longer term. So that debt is going to come back and demand payment, which of course they can't do. So it's going to require being rolled again at the end of the two year. If you issue two year debt at the end of two years, you have to pay the capital back to the original person that bought it. But you don't have that capital. So you issue a new debt to pay that person off. So the problem is she also brought duration down in that it's you're rotating your credit on your credit card. But if you had like a, a finance plan, instead of taking 10 years to pay off your house, you now are saying two years. Well, you can't. So you can only pay some of it off and then you have to refi again. And, uh, and of course, the rates of all lockstep significantly up because there's too much debt and there's too much inflation. So you get the inverse disproportionately low rates it's so easy to exist in a low rate world to it's now very difficult to exist in an ever escalating higher rate environment and you've got to remember the u.s uh, lives uh, is, is essentially if you take the 55 trillion it's a lot more than that if you have unfunded liabilities and other things but take that number it's kind of like uh, a guy on 100 grand with 5.5 million in debt and he spends 200 grand on his lifestyle so every year you're adding another 100 grand because basically the income receipts on, on the revenue, last time I heard was 52% and I think it's got worse because the tax income has dropped. So you're probably around the halfway mark or very close. Call me a liar for a couple of percent one way or another. So actually your total gross income, and don't forget they are the tax collector. They don't pay any tax to somebody else, although they do pay interest to a banking cabal that was given the unique privilege of borrowing the first dollar into existence and made them pay for it, which obviously entrenches them as the billionaire class and the banking cartel class with an exorbitant privilege. So the government does have an interest bill it now has to pay to these people that they said, okay, we won't do government money, you can do the money and you can charge us interest, meaning you charge the citizens interest and the banking cartel, the Federal Reserve and the central banks are essentially the great wealth of this uh, Ponzi scheme. So anyway, that's where we are. And the and the the anti uh, Goldilocks is the the that non feel good factor you get when things get stubbornly consistently more expensive even when everybody's spending less buying less 
uh, really borrowing less, retiring debt, and prices continue to go up and continue to kill you because you had decades worth of ever dropping rates from the Falker era to the eventual turn in the bond market, which we called in August of 2020. We said the March 2020 blow off uh, in debt valuations was the end of the debt bubble. These things will turn and that's the end. It is the end for the debt based system. The next thing, you're not going to have 40 years. You took 40 years to put this uh, hyper leverage situation. It will end in four or less. Um, in other words, it's the escalator up and it's the slam down, elevated uh, down uh, on this. You're not going to get a 40-year slow unwind. It's going to get deeply, deeply disorderly. And that's kind of where we are um, exactly now. And we've got the anti-Goldilocks economy. You had you decided you wanted six months of light and you went right up to the North Pole. But now that's where you stay. That was your deal. You wanted to only play and have fun in the light. And now you're going to have six months of dark snow and exceedingly cold weather uh, and all the gloom, misery and depression that goes with that. And so there's a, there's a beautiful balance to the world. Bring, bring consumption forward through financial engineering Eventually, you're burning the fields of tomorrow uh, and the meals of tomorrow and the food of tomorrow. Now, you can't bring things forward. You actually have to retire that debt. What ends up happening is all your consumption goes away and all that you brought forward for years into the future, you now don't have those nice things to buy anymore, those luxury goods, those extra items, that extra stuff. It's the complete corollary. So you pay the piper or the system fails and both will happen. There will be payment of the piper. You and I, as retail servants, surf will not get the privilege of a complete write down uh, and start again okay set the clock your debt will not be retired and if it is then you will be complying to a new system that they will be doing that will be your deal cbdc compliance this condition uh, holds you need to stay up to date on your biomedical warfare injections uh, brought to you by various other and you know particularly aggressive uh court statist organizations you have to comply in this way social score hate speech your twitter account da 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 da, da. make sure you good boy less stake because you're killing the climate because of cow farts etc cetera, etc cetera. so that, uh, that's a long form answer for you but in essence we unfortunately now are in the dark side and i'm not a black pilled um nihilist who just wants to tell doom scroll type uh, serfdom. All I'm saying is after six months of day, you're going to get six months of night. Uh, that's unfortunately how the, the, you know, the geometry works. Uh, if you bring forward all your meals, you're going to not want to eat for a long, long time because you're going to be so sick and nauseous. It, it, every system works like this. Uh, and this is where we're at. And we have to look at all the binges we did and realize that, what was abundance, you know, it's like Romans in the vomitarium and eating more meals and more meals and carrying on eventually collapse. It just, you just don't get away with that. Uh, and that's, that's, that's where we are on the anti-global, anti-Goldilocks economy. <clears throat> Thanks for running us through that. Yeah. As, as you said, it's really a depth analysis of, I guess, at the past and, and, and sort of where we are currently and what we can expect in the future. Um, I, I guess from your perspective, are, are, is there any comparison to, to the past where, that we could look at where we, we might be going? So is it similar to the 70s that you were talking about? And then we'll have 10 years of this. There might be growth, but really high inflation. And then we need a Volcker to come in or is there any other periods that you can compare it to? So there are no periods that we can compare the scale of this to. People have associative thinking and they like to compare certain traits of where we are now to certain traits that have to some degree pre-existed. So when you're in an abyss, you're looking for something familiar to hold on to. And so you go, oh, it's like the 70s. And I hear all of this all the time. Um, or people say, oh, we'll just have disinflation like Japan. And, and you know, no, America's not Japan. They don't have the same situation. No, we aren't the 70s. We are far worse than the 70s. Again, that makes me sound like some sort of black pill doom scroller. Um, no, no, not at all. It's just the scale of this is so much larger. So the 70s essentially had uh, a large part of the world disconnected and out of sync with each other. 
you had other economies that were going up. South Africa in the 70s, where I am today, was amazing. They were pulling a thousand tons out of the gold. They, of course, had an apartheid system that many people question morally, quite correctly, probably. Um, but uh, it was boomtown. If you happen to be uh, uh, a white Anglo-Saxon person here working in industry, it was a great place to live, great lifestyle. Everybody was doing great. But then, of course, yeah, you know, so that there was a lot of unsync different economies all over the place at various stages of development. What we've actually done is we've enforced, and I say we, this is the central banking cartel that has done this. Uh, we have enforced a synchronized uh, leper colony of sins that everybody had to kiss the chief leper and enter the leper colony to do. So in essence, you have a global nation state that are all synchronized into a hyper indebted state level and personal credit and debt level. And if uh, we did an interview with uh, Professor Werner, uh, Richard Werner of Princes of the Yen on our YouTube channel, and guys, welcome to go watch that. But he confirmed that in actual fact, the Japanese, the Bank of Japan, from the post-war degree settlement was managed actively by the, uh, the, the Federal Reserve and the actors behind it. So when Japan was exporting too much stuff and the US was running too large a trade deficit with it and the Americans wanted the support for the dollar during the Vietnam War and all of that, they went to Japan and said, it appears you have a saving problem. Too many people saving too much money. And of course, you're selling too much stuff to us. Like that's a problem. For Japan, it actually wasn't a problem, but they got sold a solution anyway. And they got sold what then became the 80s boom and bust where people were physically called and told and offered money and told how much money they would make. They had one of the most aggressive, aggressive. And again, listen to that video because Werner says it in his own words better than I could ever. They were encouraged to borrow, borrow, lever up and buy and to become uber, uber wealthy. They had greed injected in them and they did a hyper lending to the point that I think the 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 one uh, palace in Japan was worth more than all of Manhattan Island. Real estate went up so, 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 so much. So they did a hyper borrowing. Of course, the Nikkei ran to just under 40,000 um, from, you know, low single digit thousands. And then it once it collapsed, it's never it hasn't got there since. And we're only now calling it to get there. And that's part and parcel a function of a currency crisis, which was caused and is the lead the lead first tier nation in trouble. That is now getting the down breath of terrible demographics. This is also coming for America, but it comes for Japan first. So they have 0.91 uh, kids per every two uh, parents. So they're not even replacing one parent. So you have more um, adult nappies being sold than child nappies in Japan. And of course, on top of that, you have a pensions crisis where pensions commitments have been made and all the quantitative easing that were first tested in Japan before it became mainstream here in the West. So Japan did have some things which were future tested as part and parcel of how you deal with a hyper indebted nation uh, that did that. But there's lots of differences with Japan. The individual citizens didn't have maxed out credit cards like Americans. They didn't. Uh, and they supported their own government's Ponzi scheme by buying their own government's um, uh, debt bills. While in America, the Americans aren't buying enough T-bills. The pension funds aren't buying enough T-bills. America needs other nation states to buy T-bills. This is why I say you can't do too much associative thinking because it can look similar on the surface and be very, very different. So this is essentially hyperstagflation, which is our phrase that we've brought around, because it is an incredibly intense and global version of that aspect that people are recognizing occurred in uh, America and to the West to some degree during the 70s, but was mainly an American thing as a result of Vietnam War and dollar devaluation uh, and led to uh, very, very high interest rates. Uh, and that brought literally farmers to New York to complain, like, you know, like the French do, only that was America. It, took a, it takes a while for that to happen. So Falker was deeply, deeply unpopular because he was the pain central banker, but he was the serious one, the last semi-serious one that dealt with the issue of inflation and cleaned the decks for Greenspan to come and party like there's no tomorrows and be the liquidity king. Um, and as a result, we have huge debt and with America's low tax take and dropping ever lower and more boomers retiring, um, 
and more useless degrees with less productive work that's going now offshore and elsewhere. And you cease to be a, a, a leader in, in a lot of industries now because you're not meritocracy because you're worried about whether the toilets allow someone who is male to go pee in the female toilet who thinks he's a woman. And these are now your these are now your priorities due to a cultural revolution led by a certain group of people. As a result, you cease to be a meritocracy uh, and you start to give up ground in the, the game because you thought you had so much momentum, you had so much going for you, you're so big, you can't even spoil it. Well, eventually you do spoil it. Ask Zimbabwe, the bread basket of Africa, at one point, that was tobacco, wheat, grains, proteas, you name it. They were growing everything for everyone. Uh, and now their, their roads are still the same roads as Ian Smith. Massive potholes, hardly usable, etc. So eventually you do break things. That takes a while, but they do. And so that's what's coming, unfortunately, for America. And they've got debt coming faster than I can see, plus rollover debt that has to be renewed and sold. So what we actually have is way too much debt and now we have uh, significantly higher interest rates than was at the, the March uh, 2020 lows. So what happens to that? Well, now your interest rate payment is more than your defense budget in the States. So this is this is failed mathematics. It's complete failure of accounting mathematics. And it is the man with uh, 100 grand salary spending 200 grand a year with 5.5 million in debt that's now gone from 0.3 to 5.5 percent so and, that, and that he's got to pay his credit card and guess what other people who are lending you money no longer want to lend you to pay that because eventually everybody says you bust you bust eventually the confidence is gone and the thing that keeps that assertiveness is a military um, and the fact that the dollar is so embedded in other systems so what that initially happens is the way this fails everyone's thinking well america screwed actually all the countries that have American denominated debt and can't print dollars are actually screwed because there's actually ironically because of in the nature of loans and having to pay interest as well, you have to pay back more dollars than you borrow. So that means you need to get your hands on more borrowers. So our FX emerging markets debt repayments in dollars, they are the ones that are uh, first to go in terms of this great Ponzi screen. And in actual fact, you'll get the perversion of the dollar actually going up because there's not enough dollars internationally, offshore, out of America, for offshore countries that borrowed in dollars to return pay uh, the dollar-based debt. So you're going to get a massive degree of restructuring and uh, various other aspects going on. And a lot of liquidity provision from the Fed offshore, possibly, to certain nation states that are favored and ones that are less favored being hung out to dry. So that's what's coming next, emerging market crises, where the economic hitman, if you read the Perkins book, about how they got all the uh, you know African states and other nation states, we'll put in an airport, Halliburton will do it for you, you can borrow from us, that'll get you elected, we'll get you voted in, we'll provide the money and the TV coverage, let us get hold of your media, da 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 da, just do as we say and you can become our puppet, prime minister, president, etc. And of course, lots of people to steal took that deal. Uh, but it's short termism over pragmatism and the citizens are the ones that get destroyed and they get loaded up with a debt on them. And the, you know, the middle ranking politicians are the ones that steal and are corrupt. So that's our economic system. It's one that's been Trojanized and parasitically, hopelessly parasitically uh, uh, penetrated to the point that, you know, the fleas are hanging on the jugular and sucking milk and we are having to keep this body alive. Uh, the, the true honest workers. What ends up happening is eventually the scale of it's too big and the, the entire animal drops dead. That's where we're at. Okay, so as you said, a, a scale that we haven't experienced before. And it, it sort of seems like you're talking a lot like it's a, it's a point that I heard about recently and I thought it made a lot of sense where the last 40 years, as you're saying, Warren Buffett really benefited from duration, but we're actually getting at the opposite where shorter duration, say, you know, through shorter bonds or even uh, co companies that focus on cash flow rather than growth are the ones that are really going to benefit in this new economy. You definitely want to be a positive cash flow business. You definitely want to be a positive cash flow business. But even ones that are positive cash flow now, if they're reliant on consumers or positive cash flow other businesses to fund them, in an environment where there's going to be so much collapse, even positive cash flow businesses will cease to be positive cash flow businesses. 
In other words, once too much of the system is rotten and is collapsing, it's like talking about a great building and you've got great, you know, concrete pillars holding up part of the floors and on the other sides, you've got rotting wood holding up one side. If, if enough of the, if it rots, it doesn't matter that you've got one or two good pillars. <clears throat> eventually you get collapsed. Yes, you'll still have a little bit more of a structure where there was some stuff that's good, but it's not going to be in a good state generally. It's all marked down by the general environment decaying because you can't be insulated from a destroyed consumer. You can't be insulated from a destroyed commercial business environment, and you can't be insulated from a destroyed statist spending environment who continued to get debt to buy until people say no we won't allow you to lend anymore you've lost your license to do that so when all that income stream it doesn't matter what business you're in unless you're a farmer literally with all your own equipment paid for and you own the land um, you will be able to provide for your own means that which you farm and barter with other farmers and other people who will hopefully have something positive they do that they can actually recompense you for food because otherwise, you're sitting in a very, very treacherous uh, situation. So the, 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 the career choices that are right to soil, ground roots, where the value is coming out and you control the whole mechanism, which is why I mentioned farming, is uh, going to be certainly a lot safer. But, of course, the statists know that. And when you look at revolutions like the Bolshevik Revolution led by a certain class of people, the people they went after were the middle class and the farmers. And if you look at recent events in Amsterdam, uh, Holland, I mean, uh, and various other places, you are seeing the hunt for land. And when you see what the the, the areas that Bill Gates is buying and uh, BlackRock, etc., not just rental homes, but also farming land and you see the 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 onus that is being put and the pressures put on farmers. Oh, sorry, too many cows. You're releasing too much methane. And as a result of climate, you have to right size your herd down. So there are already attack vectors. They know they have pre-planned this. They know where you will have hiding places and they're already spiking the water in those places with ridiculous law, legal system and, and mandates. So unfortunately, you know, and I'd love to say the enemy is stupid and you're going to be able to fox them and just move and run and pivot here and do this and they won't have thought of it all. But they pretty much know that. And, and sometimes when I warn gold holders that just holding gold as security uh, against um, uh, in the name of sound money principles against fiat is definitely the right thing to do. But to think that just holding it is going to be enough and that you're not going to be coerced asked to register it, this man with a clipboard doesn't come around and then later they want to tax for it or then they want to confiscate it or you start lying under great duress of criminal edict. These guys can write the laws to do anything. So anything that does anything to save you, remember, you need to view this as a war. This is economic, financial, long game warfare where there is a status control that wants a total global Bolshevik communism where they are the overlords. Uh, I was actually reading a, a tweet here. There's a certain concept of tikkum ulam, that is a, a Israeli type concept, where we are healing the world. What they mean by that, repair the world, sounds really nice. But in this repair the world class, it is them that is ruling, that has the control to supposedly repair the world. And it's you who's lost the levers of control to do anything. And they are doing this now on your behalf, these kind benefactors, when in actual fact, it just means we take control and we're in charge and you are not in control anymore. And this is our job to do. And you are now a serf. As, as everyone was uh, reduced to serfdom in the communist revolution and actually eating with cutlery was actually a sign of middle class dumb and could get you beaten up. You actually had to dumb down and dip your bread in your stew and sit in the street and eat um, like a commoner for want of being otherwise being identified uh, for elimination and having airs and grace or being bourgeois. Um, as they say. So you're facing a really aggressive force that wants to bring in a global control mechanism that is draconian and lockstep. And it's a horror movie that I'm talking. And I'm afraid if you prepare for that, and I'm in, in any way marginally wrong, it's only upside. So that's that's cool by me. I'd sooner know. I'd sooner set a really low bar of expectation and be prepared for almost anything. Because the problem is I keep getting 
pretty accurate with my guessing or guesswork on the events of March 2020, what not to do, what to do. You know, I tend to guess right on a lot of these things. Not that I'm 100% right on everything all the time and certainly not on markets that can move suddenly, but we get quite a bit right about the social cultural direction of what's going on. Um, and you, you've got to, uh, if you understand that, if you've got the right template that makes certain things predictive, you know more how you must position and prepare. And uh, it's on the onus is on everybody to do that. Uh, so yes, own gold. Yes, possibly even Bitcoin. But have no illusions about digitization. It is a trap. All forms of digitized money is a trap. Spend cash right here where I am. I draw big handfuls of cash and I pay people in cash everywhere. And there's a couple of places that say, oh, we are um, cashless. You know, I, I avoid them. I avoid them and I punish them. And I encourage you to do the same. Spend cash, draw cash, no data. No one is given your privacy uh, information. Nobody knows where you were at a particular time doing something. And it's not because I'm doing much interesting. It's not like my wife is going to find out that uh, I've gone and uh, have done anything particularly interesting there or somebody who's uh, I've owed money to is going to find out I'm spending money at a casino. It's not because I really have anything to hide. It's just I don't want aspects my dandruff essentially your metadata is almost like dandruff it's falling off you all the time it's this tiny stuff you don't notice that you shed all the time where you move where you do what you do how you're doing it what time what was it you bought how much money did you pay did you pay with this card that card don't give them that information they want it all because that's how they will later be controlling you they will be collecting all that data they have huge systems aladdin all the banks and these are not uh, good things. These are not for your privacy. These are not for your benefit. And they will tell you to make it safer and more secure. And you need to push back against this. Yep. So you previously mentioned in the 70s that, you know, South Africa, I guess the, the certain part of the population did quite well. And there's other countries that actually benefited while others weren't. So do you see that there's sort of a similar theme where some countries are going to benefit during this period and others aren't? The sad fact, as I mentioned, is far more of a, of a global uh, village has been synchronized now in terms of indebtedness. So it is harder. So China's totally indebted. They never used to be indebted. They were initially communist. Now they're hopelessly indebted, worse in some ways than even America. Um, you, uh, other nations are. That said, they're still in terms of, I would say, rather than you know uh, how much in debt and banks monitoring, all of these things are coming in all those countries. It's amazing, even bad countries, you know, like Zimbabwe, when you go to the airports, they all have biometric uh, machines uh, and passports. Uh, the one thing they'll do is their revenue collection and their, uh, you know, their airports and track and trace and their banking systems and all of that. That's, that will all become, you won't get a road, you'll get nothing as a citizen, but that all comes. So the sad fact is um, there's much more synchronization than in the 70s globally. There's much less variation in how things are done or run. But still within that, in terms of enforcement, different laws, there is arbitrage to be had that will see you have a better lifestyle in certain countries than in others. So I personally don't wish to be in particularly cold countries, uh, particularly dark and overly wet countries uh, for vitamin D, health, outdoor existence, etc. I want to have a certain plot size minimum. I don't want a neighbor right on top of me. Um, I don't, uh, I, you know, I want to be able to have access to big inland farms that I can buy and invest in that will also secure me um, lamb and, uh, you know, game, uh, organic meat that is not being drugged up, various other things. So these are these are things you can think about. Um, and that's why actually Southern Africa still remains of interest to me, even though, you know, people will say, oh, but there's no power. I know there's no power and it's priced in that there's no power and you buy your independence with, with solar panels and batteries. You buy bore, most of the place I'm looking at all got boils, independent of power, independent on water. So, you know, if you're looking at something like that, what you're actually saying is you pay your rates and taxes on the land for someone to collect your rubbish, which you'll probably get screwed on. You accept that battery, but it can only go a certain degree up. Uh, and you provide for yourself at a utility level at all levels. You filter your own water, you 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 pull it up from river borehole, you grab enough sun, 
um, for me to, to be in a cold climate with not a lot of sun and not be independent of states is a trap. It's a dangerous trap. And the thing is, these countries that are already in that state are just a little ahead of you and you buy cheaper because of that. So you get priced in something that's already there that's going to come for other areas and other parts of the world where you're still paying stupid prices with lots of leverage, where there's still a lot of financial engineering in. Um, so uh, sometimes it's better to buy with a, a, a downside already baked in and then be independent. Because actually, if you're in the smart grid and they have all of these things, they'll know when you switch your kettle on. I don't care for that. I don't want to sell electricity back. I'm not in utility business to make money. Um, I'd rather just nobody provides to me and nobody gets any information. That's that's liberty. Um, if I wanted to, I could, uh, you know, solar panel up and use way less than I need to and over over provide and sell back. Okay, but that, I don't think you're going to become a millionaire like that. You have to scale that immensely. You may as well be a Bitcoin miner or something else. Uh, but if you want to do solar panels and go buy up half the Karoo here, which is semi-desert, and go and do it, you'll have to put security in. You're going to have to run pipes. It's a different business. Uh, I'm not sure that's my, my business. Maybe it will be in the future, but I don't feel it now. Um, but those are things to think about. Uh, while you're building wealth also in the markets and trading, uh, but when I say trading, it's not day trading. It's, it's long-term positions, and it's more investing with occasional minor elements of leverage for high conviction, long-term trades. Uh, and that's that's our game. And we, you know, we listened to Drucken Miller speak and he said, oh, it's the hardest market to call. And we just said, but why is no one talking about the, we've been talking for two and a half years about the devaluation of the, the, the Japanese debt and the yen. You know, you've got this container that is essentially a worse demographic than America, doesn't, isn't the currency of the world, is a tier one nation that you can short and, and be charged very low interest on. And you can have in deposits in America where you'll get 5%. So for us, we, you know, we've been, those are opportunities that should be put on and set and forget because debt has to go down. That means rates are going to go higher. It's more likely you're going to get a disorderly spike. I don't think that we're going to get a measured, continual, slowing, slowing, continual climb up to 10% like Falker errors all through central bank policy no we'll go another 0.25 they're going to do it i don't think that i don't think there's the strength to feed that what i think happens is too much debt comes to market nobody wants to buy it so you get an, an, a disorderly event where the debt market collapses which implies that there's an immediate spike in the rates it's a people don't understand that it's like your human body in a in a under a street lamp and you have a shadow borrowed into existence money francis the shadow, the debt. If France suddenly gets a massive fright in the dark night street and runs, the shadow runs right after him, right behind him. So you can't get a devaluation in Francis collapsing to the ground without the shadow following in the exact opposite direction. So um, there is, in my opinion, our great theory that sort of is, is the equivalent of Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory is the interest rate super spike on debt, uh, debt market collapse. Uh, and funny enough, it dovetails quite nicely with his theory, because I think you're going to get it globally, but you're going to get it also in the dollar and you'll get an extreme strength of the dollar for a spike because of the interest rate spike. No one will be able to pay. No one will be able to get dollars. There'll be defaults, not being able to pay dollars. They'll be desperately looking for dollars. So suddenly you get a lot of bid for dollars at that time. The Fed will obviously be happy to print a whole bunch and try to keep the dollar down, but it'll happen so quickly that you'll first get a disorderly amount. And, and for those that think that's not possible because it breaks straight away, well, it will break, uh, but there will, you'll still get the events happen. Just go look at George Soros's short of the pound and the events and there's lots of old funny clips still on youtube some of them are very grainy they're less than 480p uh but you can see like dealers saying 15 percent. i can't who wants my house I, i'm giving who wants to buy a house he's like he's shouting at all his mates who wants to buy his house because he you know he's he obviously got a house and he was paying three or four five percent now it's the rates are spiked to 15 it's more than three and a half times uh he can't afford to make his uh bond payment he's a dealer on a floor while this is all happening and they've just announced the bank of england is panicking and upgrades again and upgrades again and upgrades again they'll they weren't doing it because the economy was strong 
They were doing it to stop the collapse of the pound. The collapse of the pound is a part and parcel. Money and debt are the human and the shadow that I was just referring to. So you can have the collapse of the currency or you can have the collapse of the debt. Either way, the debt going down, you're going to have to spike the interest rates. The currency goes down with it. So what happens is everything compared to the dollar, it's the biggest Ponzi of the lot. All the flight goes to the liquidity and the dollar goes up and uh, all the emerging markets start to fail. And I've discussed the global village of currencies with the, you know, the, the smaller currencies are left outside the, the main wall even. You know, they're the first to be slaughtered by the coming Gothic horde, you know, that are attacking the Romans. Uh, you know, they're just easy scalps. Before they start banging the wall down, it gets ever more difficult. So they get killed. And of course, when they get sacrificed, everybody starts using the dollar. Uh, Turkey uses the dollar, you know, it has the dollar as a backup currency. So you get more demand for dollars, you get a bigger spike uh, in the dollar. So there's going to be an interest rate uh, currency event. But during all of this happening, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to let you all focus on that and see this all happening and understanding how that plays out. They're going to throw up the biggest geopolitical war or uh, crisis or climate lockdown or some other thing that's going to keep people confused, spellbound, not, around, not able to move and distracted from this financial event so that uh, they can quickly, like the magician, look here, look this hand, look this hand, look this hand and steal with the other hand. Uh, it's got to it's got to be distraction. It's got to be uh, you're going to see a masterclass of distraction perpetuated by your mainstream media. Everyone's going to turn on the TV to find out what's happening. One of the worst things you can do is to find uh, to, to, to be told how to react by the TV. They'll give you a part story, half truth and half completely deceiving. They'll scapegoat the wrong thing and they'll send everybody hating on somebody here and not on the right guy and everybody doing exactly the wrong action, stampeding. You literally have to invert, watch the TV and invert what they do. You know, the TV told you to lock down, stay indoors and get a vaccination. So what you do is go outside, live healthy, do lots of physical exercise uh, and, and trust your immune system. <laughs> That was, that was the right order, literally the inversion of everything. So you watch the TV to wait for what Tony Blair says, and you apply the inverse Tony Blair monitor, a World Economic uh, Forum captured Zio Pig, uh, and you just know, do the inverse of the Zio Pig. What do I need to do? What does the inverse Zio Pig say I must do? Good. Invert it. I'm good. That's what you do. That's it. That's literally what you do. In terms of, I don't think you're going to get financial advice, but they'll say, stay calm, stay at home. So, you know, it's time to panic and go and get your money as fast as hell. Um, so, you know, just keep applying the, the inverse Xiopig principle uh, and you're going to probably be better. But the problem is by the time that crisis starts, there'll be limitations and restrictions. So you actually need to be preparing now. It's not while you're woken up at um, 2 a.m. in the morning and your wooden house is burning down that you can have the perfect plan to put it out. You're in trouble. You need to have prepared before that. All the pails of water, the pump, uh, you know, the you know, the high pressure, all of that's got to be sorted beforehand. Um, so you can do that. So I'm saying to you, there is an inferno coming. How ready are you to put it at the fire out when, because they are also going to make it at 2 a.m., the worst time when you're at your weakest and your lowest, most distracted, most exhausted by some other event that happened just before to pre-exhaust you. That's how they're going to do it. That's how it always is. They need you at your lowest common denominator. So fear is the thing. I'd rather try and make you scared now and get you prepared so that mentally, psychologically, you are further down the path and better able to deal with the actual crisis that will come. Because what you need to do is you, you've got to train hard so to fight easy. What you don't do is, hey, everything's easy, and then end up in a fight and get beaten the flip up. And that's kind of the exact problem. So I'm training hard right now so that I can fight this fight easy because the fight is coming. Uh, and that's a, that's a big part of this uh, economic narrative. Okay, no, it makes sense. So you've mentioned quite a few assets like, uh, I guess, land, real assets, crypto, gold. So you think those are the ones that are going to at least hold their value. Uh, so period. Bitcoin, um, look, it, it, it's high volatility. And when we've had demand destroying events, it falls pretty damn hard. And in fact, I was mentioning to you just as we're coming in, there's a slightly risk off type feel coming back into the markets uh, now. I'm watching oil. So the difference between, say, oil and gold is that oil is a consumer driven co commodity. And when economic activity goes down, what tends to happen, maybe I'll share the screen and we can 
uh, if you give me permission to uh, share screen there on the Zoom, I'll uh, share the screen. Um, what actually yep. happens is the consumer element. When you uh, look at the consumer uh, element of trying to uh, to buy things, people travel less, they stay at home more, they don't drive, they don't fly, they don't go on holiday, they stop buying things, packaging, deliveries, all of that slows the hell down. So that's typical, typical of what goes down, uh, Anthony, when um, we're starting to lose. So oil goes down probably more than gold will. Uh, as I say, there we go. The, Should be able uh, to share it. Share now. Yeah, let's do it. So, I mean, if you just have a look at this, that's quite a strong sell-off that's occurred here. Fatten this up a bit. Uh, you can see we're on a, a four-hour. I'll show you on the daily yep. in a minute, but you've certainly had that channel there like that. You've come down to this a uh, bit of a magic level for us at 82, and now you're spilling here. That's that's not super bullish. It's not super bullish because if everybody's doing so great, why aren't they traveling? Why aren't they flying? Why aren't they deliver, getting goods delivered? Why aren't tankers bringing lots of motorcycles and cars and things around? Why aren't, you know, it's priced at the margin, um, but why is this happening? I'll show you on the daily. And um we we called that top at 130 uh go and check our oil history on our website themarketsniper.com uh, but you can see there down then we said okay 82.50 is a very interesting level will it do a reversal here or will it invalidate that is right now today we are literally talking right now this potential reversal there was a left shoulder then a complex kind of head here and that was a right shoulder. That potential reversal that started there and implied a 106.94 could be on the cards is reverting. That means it's not going to happen. You have run the stop loss. That is the right, uh, that is that uh, my right shoulder. Yeah, uh, that was a falling wedge. You got your right shoulder dip and then you broke. And that was, oh, okay, great. We're going up on oil. And then after the slam down that brought you down really hard, didn't like that thought. I don't know about, I don't think this pattern is going to work. Um, and it's feedback. So we draw patterns, not because they're right, but because they tell you something. That pattern as a, a potential reversal, inverted head and shoulders is what I've called it there, not going to happen in actual fact. Uh, so it gives me feedback and tells me that economically, things are not as great as you think. You could be hearing about a, a crisis or a drama at some point. That is spilling out of a falling wedge where normally, you know, falling wedges break up. That is a type three falling wedge. It's a break. Uh, and look at this on a bigger time frame. That's coming down. And then we were also saying, well, gold uh, could be doing a bit better. Uh, it, is it going strongly above 2000? And actually, um, it's struggling as well at the moment. So people also buy gold. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's go over there. So it's also coming off a little bit on the, the daily. Let me just keep all the lines off for a second. And on the four hour, you can see it. So that's also was huffing and puffing past the 2000. We are big believers in uh, the precious metals, but this is losing a bit of steam. And you can see you let through, let go of that. Now there's a risk here that again, you might get a head and shoulder. You might have a left shoulder and you might go up and over. So just because if we start, if we get a rally here, a weak rally and over, you could be ready for uh, a reversal to the downside. Uh, so, uh, and that's after just clearing the 2000 mark for a while. I don't think we go as far back as we had on previous times. So we are bullish gold, uh, just to be clear, but right now on a shorter time frame, right now what's happening uh, a little bit of a post 2000k pullback. So if we have a look at that, a little bit of a post 2000k pullback. I think we get above 2000 when we end up going to 3000 in time. But if we have a disinflationary event uh, occurring, um, you'll find that this uh, this broadening structure on that bull run, you're going to maybe come back down into here before you go and you break. So you might have a deeper dip before we finally let go of the $2,000 uh, mark, which is roughly there. So, so, so this is, in your opinion, does this mean like a stronger dollar in the short term? Or, or what is this showing us? Typically, yes. So risk off typically is a bit of a stronger dollar. 
So if we have a look um, at the euro USD, it's a good question, by the way. So uh, dollar dominance mac at a macro level is our theme. You heard from the interest rate scenario spike. That is our scenario. Um, I just need a cooler name uh, like Brent's uh, milkshake theory to do it. But if you have a look at this, euro USD was going up. It's slightly off. It's not showing as much on the currencies. So you had the euro USD going up and it's a little bit of a down week this week, but we haven't had a lot of the week. But if you have a look at the day, so the dollar is getting stronger. So the euro USD is coming off. But generally, we've already had a very long spell of dollar strength. And now we had this rally which was kind of flag like so i think i think we will end up coming and that you will end up going back down through this but i don't think the euro is actually we love to hate the euro but i don't think it's the worst currency at the moment of course i talk about the yen and this is why i thought there may be a reason for the yen to rest but because that 152 was not well appreciated last time we pulled back but I think we are going to be going higher at some point. But there was a shooting star there. So we'll have to see if it keeps trucking upwards or whether it takes a localized rest because you've got two very key points around 152. So the USD yen is going to be pivotal. But you can see how this currency has gone. And if I put that back, that's when we were calling go short the yen and long the dollar. You could have got 110. And of course, you had 150 now. That's huge. That's huge in percentage terms for that. And of course, you could have obviously got up top there. And this has been debt markets that are driving this. This is a problem with debt that's driving this. And interest rates is about debt. It's about debt. That's the, the, the issue. So they desperately need to let, because they were doing yield curve control, trying to support their debts value, because every little Japanese lady has bought all her life the Bank of Japan's debt because it's conservative and it was paying a certain amount. But now they're going to start letting those rates climb. You see, you actually almost touched 1%. We've, we had a target of 1.6 when this was way down at uh, below 0.75. So we are seeing 1.6. You see how those interest rates are being allowed to climb now, where before they were keeping them locked and loaded at 20, uh, 25% over here. Then they let them go to 50 they're having to do that because their currency is getting butchered. So the way I explain the yen is that you've got a kind of a canister, a, a, you know, this think of this oil drum with a fire underneath it. And the pressure is building in this thing. It's going to blow. And you've got two taps to release pressure. And one is interest rates going up. And if you let the interest rates go up, then the debt devalues. So that sort of shrinks down. It kind of cools the canister. Or letting your currency devalue. That also, if you let the currency devalue, but both those taps have to keep being further open because the fire keeps heating up this combustible, the potentially explosive uh, event. And if you aren't draining perpetually the pressure off, so they have to continually do something. And when they were locking and holding the uh, rates at the 0.25 level and saying, no, yield curve control, we're supporting, we are 70% of the debt market, we'll keep buying it. Our sales monetize, monetize uh, because of that hyper borrowing 300% to GDP type situation that they got put into thanks to the Fed solving their savings problem and uh, uh, their exports and def trade deficit that they had with the US. Um, so what you end up doing is you, they were when they were holding the rates, they weren't opening the one tap. They were, so the, the, the other tap had to be open really wide. Otherwise, it was going to blow. That was the yen devalue. Now they're starting to open the other one too, but they actually have to keep doing more of it because they're still the worst. Even though the trend is improving, they're allowing the interest rates to short. There's a massive difference between 5.5% and 0.872. So until they get to the levels where they're at the same interest rates as America, they continue to need to devalue. In other words, they're overheating, ready to explode. So they have to keep the combination of currency devaluation and debt de devaluation, which is interest rates up and yen down. Um, it's just the degree that varies per tap, uh, if that makes sense. So you, they continually running on this treadmill of this potential explosion um, taking place. And, you know, there isn't a better metaphor that I can come up with for trying to explain uh, explain that. So it's quite a weird set of markets. So I'm interested, actually, I have no idea what the SMP is doing today. I didn't check the charts. But uh, essentially, if you're getting gold coming a tiny bit off, you um you you've not got the dollar too super strong 
but it's it is getting stronger. We've actually got the spy up, it seems today. So the equities are getting a little bit of up. So that helps a bit for Bitcoin as well. So th there's some risk on. It's a little bit up today on the equities after the snapback. But what you can see is during this dollar strength period and the, the debt market interest rate climbing period, stock market came down. So it's only now that it met the US tenure. We said it's going to do 5%, then it's going to have a rest. So it met the 5%. Now it's back down at 4 So that actually means the, the American debt is actually going up a little bit. It's having a counter trend rally period as the rates come off. This has allowed a risk on uh, fields. And that's why the dollar is not particularly strong one way or another. It was actually quite weak from the payrolls number on Friday. And, you know, today and yesterday kind of had a minor pullback. So the, the stock market wants a weak dollar and wants a strong bond market. It doesn't, it wants the rates down, but it's not going to get that for very long because we've got to go longer or something's got to break, in which case the stock market collapse like a COVID event. And then they do QE and then it has, you know, a, a reverse pump up. So we wait, everybody's almost waiting for when they're going to do quantitative easing again, because that's going to jack gold up. That's going to jack Bitcoin up. People forget that Bitcoin went up as a result of real dollar destruction on a basis of seven trillion being printed. You go hold that Dixie chart under the BTC chart. They absolutely uh, put the fire under all risk on it, uh, with with that uh, quantitative easing because it ends up chasing into assets all this loose sloshing money. It's not being given to you or I. We would go buy, you know, cars and clothes or maybe some investment in gold, et cetera, et cetera. They, it's going to corporations and uh, high net worth individuals that are shareholders of the right companies that are implementing the right BlackRock policies, et cetera. Yeah. Which other markets would you like me to have a look at? Should we take a look at Bitcoin? I know you have some crypto fans. Yeah, sure. Let's look at Bitcoin. So what you're seeing with the stock market going up is supportive a little bit for Bitcoin, but it is in a grinding higher state. So it went up very strongly and now it's more inching up. So that's a decent candle. Um, we're on the daily. So it did test a little lower and now it's trading up with uh, equity markets and the fact that the dollar is not overwhelmingly strong. It's just a little bit of rally back after the poor non-farm. So it's better than the euro, but not significantly the best day is actually when dollars giving up ground for the euro in terms of the currency sides for bitcoin but generally i don't tend to chase in on grinds like that you know obviously the place to have been was here we unfortunately were incorrect on something on our opinions we were concerned for bitcoin's lack of progress so we were originally bulls um on the the reversal here and then we got a little bit concerned that it was taking too long I'm going to find a, a less annotated Bitcoin chart quickly, BTC, USD. I've got a lot of stuff, but I don't want to lose it. So uh, broadly over here, we uh, let's get a little bit more uh, of this view. We said there was a reversal bottom here. shoulder and shoulder and head but we started to get a bit concerned when it came for a second time down to its neckline at the 25k because it broke very impressively and was making great progress and it's okay to revisit once but then it went only marginally higher and then revisited all the way back down and that was now quite some time after the original break anthony uh, and so we're going, uh, we've got a target of around 40 here, which will take you into the middle of this big flag. Uh, there was a bear flag on the way down. We kind of through that period, you had a really important bit of price pay over here. So that brings you through the, that level. So we were expecting that run, but then we got out of crypto because we were fearing that this would turn into a head and shoulders the other way. And then we're about to get uh, the problem we have is there's a piano ready to fall on our head and we don't know when. Until it falls, we want to be in the bull market of crypto, 
But if it shows sign that it's slowing down and there could be something non-standard coming out, but then the ETF news came and then the spike. So we didn't get the benefit of that uh, write up because we took risk off because we were concerned that that might uh, come down and form a head and shoulder and break back down and that you might have a bigger basing period. You know, you might go like this, like that, and then come back down one more time and then go, and then this turns into your reversal and then you go. So it's very hard to know. We're in, we know we're in a turn and we expect a bullish year out of 2024, but sometimes you can revisit a couple of times as part of your basing. You don't know that. And any sign of loss of momentum makes us nervous. But actually, uh, I still expect it to make 40. I'm just a bit, I just don't want to rush in. So it's actually a couple of other alts that are kind of interesting. So we spoke of, um, we, we got back into our XRP that's had a little bit of a run, but now it's kind of looking a little bit like it's uh, had a bit of a run and it's topping out. So let's just show you the XRP as well. Um, let's find that uh, ripple because I expect this to play a big role in the statism um, and central bankers. So you can see that had a nice little move in it. So again, on a lower time frame, let's go to maybe 12 hours. We spotted this first setup in a new trend over here. The squeeze. And we said, okay, now that Bitcoin is, you know, the ETF news is coming and it's more buoyant. And then it's squeezed again there. And now it's charged up to quite a heavy key levels of significant space. And that's taken a bit of a rest there. So, uh, but we expect this one to do very well. We have a $16.77 target to be run, which we expect to be overperformed to, but not tomorrow. This is a big macro call on this one. This is, you need to look at the weekly chart. So we do expect this to play a major, major role. Lots of lines. Uh, I don't want to over confuse people. So I'll take them off because it looks messy otherwise. But if you look at this in a log scale format, So you had a very good squeeze here and you've never returned back down here, even though there's been that second bull market ripple didn't really perform to. So we are awaiting, you know, this sort of structure and then a big move. So on crypto, we like XRP to do well, uh, but it's not tomorrow. I think this is going to come sometime in 2024, if you're asking me. First half of the year, maybe middle of the year ish. Um, and possibly a bit before, but also possibly a bit after. So it's very difficult to say exactly when. You can see here, you could have you could have thought this would gonna break there at that point. And in fact, it did. And then it came all the way back down, and you had a down wick, and then it went that point. So it's hurry up and wait, I'm afraid, with these things. Um, but very positive, very positive uh, overall. Great. Okay. Thanks for, thanks for running us through. Those are the main ones that we were interested in. So Francis, thanks so much for your time and uh, being so generous with it. I really appreciate it. Uh, my, my last question is, what is one message you like people to take away from our conversation? Yeah. So from this conversation, it's, it's a challenge is an opportunity. So I am saying you're going to face a challenge and it's actually an opportunity to shine and to be your higher and better self. It's not a dark doom scrolling just to, you know, tell you, oh, there's bad stuff. I'm like the fortune teller that says, oh, dark things are coming away, you know, and you should hide in, under your bed. Uh, it's actually an opportunity to stand up and get prepared. You have a mission in life now and your game should be surviving this and helping others to do the same. Start with your, you know, your younger brother, your younger sister, your mom and your dad, you know, uh, talk to them, chat to them about some things that are destabilizing that are potentially coming and what you're going to do as a family, as a friend or anyone else that will listen to you. And if nobody's listening to you, get into a group of people of like minded, like ours, for example, but there's others uh, and start doing plans and actions. I mean, I was meeting an awesome guy for lunch. I mean, arms, ammunition, all these things are important, security, but they're not the only things. There's some things you'll enjoy about preparing, you know, uh, learning to garden, learning to do anything, um, contemplating doing something useful. Be of value to other people by teaching what you seek to learn. 
So my message is, is learn to be of value to other people in these times by teaching uh, other people useful things. People are going to need to fix a car. I don't know what your skill set. You may be a mechanic. People are going to learn how to grow something. Be green fingered. If uh, if you haven't learned to start, but nothing. Watch YouTube. There's lots of things and materials on there. Um, People are going to need to know how to manage money better. Uh, so grow, invest, and save. Try save and live within your means. Don't build debt, retire debt. So get debt out your life. If that interest rate spike comes, it's how they turn you into their slave. Bankers turn people into slaves through interest rates and debt. That's their core tool. That's how they own your stuff, get you working for life, and then you make a mistake and you get bankrupted and you hand over your assets to them. Do not be captured. Don't get put on the wrong side of a compound interest equation. So get into being cash flow generative, positive, and building any form of small degree of preparation for a potential crisis. Think zombie apocalypse. Um, you'll think a low enough bar that if it doesn't happen, it'll actually be awesome for you uh, in terms of how you get around, who you'll network, who you'll trust, who sees the world like you and is open to it. Don't spend time trying to convince people that are not even open to the possibility. Work with people who are are ready to work with you and build those skills and invest and save and you need to have precious metals i think some of these status tokens are going to do exceptionally well xrp so that will help you build some wealth when other areas where that some of that wealth might be being destroyed so they are absolutely action paths traditional financial advice tv and mainstream media advice should be inverted follow the Ziopig inversion rule francis hunt's Ziopig inversion rule if you need an example listen to anything tony blair says and invert it um and there's others like him by the way so uh you know just what is blair doing go google it do something different what is he telling you to do uh so apply all those rules you are in a proxy war and the statist people who seek to be rulers over men are the people that are your enemies. And so they want to keep you subordinated, controlled, hemmed in, loss of freedom of movement. And you don't or shouldn't want for any of those things. So this is the great game of life. Treat this as a gamify this whole thing. It's the great game of life. Uh, are you going to be a sheep that just gets herded around? Or are you going to actually be doing things and positioning yourself to be part and parcel of a freedom, liberty oriented environment where you will have built wealth, so you'll buy yourself some freedom, you'll be buying everybody else's carbon credits to travel, because they won't have the money or the means they'll be selling their their right to eat steak that week to you etc cetera, etc cetera. b if you have to be any form of a slave be a wealthy well organized one uh, and preferably be outside the slave matrix altogether it starts here and now teach seat learn study self-reliance self-reliance on all your core needs if you can live you can have a beautiful life you know what good existences were had long before a banking cartel got the grip and the vice with mainstream media and all sorts of things around us. So it's actually a back to basics rule that's coming in. And I'm Francis Hunt. I'm the market sniper, the crypto sniper and the reset sniper. And I have a community and a YouTube channel, which you can watch entirely for free. Uh, and anything you get and learn from there, I'm as happy as a clam to give it and offer you. And if you ever want to grow beyond that and you want to learn an HVF method and build wealth through long term trading and investing in the market, not day trading. Um, and you want to see some of those opportunities that I'm discussing every day with my community members, follow the YouTube channel, book a call. There's links in there. We've been running for absolute decades now uh, and we're still out there and we have good, happy customers and community members that have been long-standing. You will get uh, updates from me regularly on the movement in the markets, like we were seeing the oil, and your community uh, friends will have skills. So I don't have all the skills. We have smarter minds in certain areas all over it, and that's an option to come and enjoy. But other communities exist. Other people exist. Anyone you find that seems honest, authentic, and that shows integrity and recognizes what's coming, learn from them as well and keep growing and become a localized teacher. That's my message for you. Everybody gets to play. We are all working against the uh, seam. In your body, when a bacteria comes, all the cells gather around and fight. Uh, and you, you, we're a cells in a, in, a, in a healing mechanism of a body that is suffering a Trojan parasite. And we have to fight that damn thing. And I'm giving you the course of action so that you can remain a healthy cell and you can combat that. Uh, and that's my message for you. And thank you for listening and inviting me on. And I hope it works out great for everybody. Prepare, prepare, prepare. Yep. No, thank, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I'll put all those descriptions, uh, links in the description below. So yep. Thanks again for your time. Absolute pleasure, Anthony. Go well.
Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.